of you might have noticed, statistics is never just about calculating numbers and saying I'm done. You always have to interpret what those numbers mean and what their implications are and things like that. You usually have some sort of research question and you need to use those numbers to go back and answer the question if possible, but if not, at least address the question, at least shine some new light on the question, give, reduce the, the uncertainty involved. So confidence intervals need to be interpreted. Let's talk about how that happens. There's basically two ways. There's kind of the standard phrasing, which is a short way of doing things. And then there's the actual technical long way. And we'll talk about both of those. So the short way, you say we are 95%, so it was a 95% confidence interval. We are 95% confident that the population mean is between, and then you give your two numbers, 2.5 and 2.9, whatever those numbers were. You use the term confident, and you are talking about subjective confidence here. Now, the, the true mean is either between those numbers or it's not. Your confidence has nothing to do with that. You can be confident or non-confident, and you can be wrong, right? Right or wrong. So this is technically okay, even though it's kind of a weaselly way to say it, but it's technically okay, and people understand what it means. Anybody who's had a good stats class and remembers what they were taught knows that this isn't um, the most technical way to talk about what a confidence interval is. But, yeah, we are 95% confident. Another one... Another way to say this is um, it's plausible that the population in mean is between these two things, but that's not as precise because we want to include the confidence level in our statement. If we did a 95% confidence interval, we say 95%. If we said if we calculated a 90% confidence interval, we say 90%, etc. These things are very, very wrong. I put the horrible wrong things in a font that looks like they're written in disgusting blood or something. There is not a 95% probability that the population mean lies between these two things. There's a, either a 1 or a 0 probability, and we don't know which one that is. Either the mean is there or it's not. We can't say there's a 95% probability that this reality is true. You can't say there's a 95% probability that my wife got home from work yet. No, either she did or she didn't. You know, there's no probability associated with that. It's an individual event. Either it's, either it's one way or it's not. Either the mean is between those numbers or it's not. So it's totally incorrect to say there's a 95% probability that the population lied. Yeah, no, you can't say that. I mean, you can, but you're wrong. So you can't say 95% of the observations are between this because that's just crazy. Think about what we're doing and you'll find out this is not the case. You also don't want to say 95% of sample means are between this. Now, that's not as crazy as the others. And if you expanded that to include everything you were talking about, maybe it would even be correct. You could say 95% of all possible sample means from a population that has this mean and this standard deviation and the samples were of this sample size would potentially be found between this and this. Like, if you expanded the whole thing, then that would work. But just as it is, there's too many unknowns. We don't know what sample means you're talking about. Um, and it doesn't mean that 95% of future sample means will be find, found between these things because future samples will have a different mean and their confidence intervals will, be, will have different limits. You know? So there's, there's nothing that says that your particular confident limit, confidence limits or your confidence interval actually represents some reality. Your confidence interval represents an estimate of the precision of your measurement, but it, it's not telling you about what's in the population. It's just an estimate of what's going on in the population. So you can't say for sure 95% of future sample means will be found there. But you can say if the population mean were the same as my sample mean, and if I were to sample a lot of times, and if all those samples had the same sample size as my sample mean, yeah, then 95% of those means would be found. But uh, that's kind of different from what's written there. What's written there is too vague. So the actual interpretation can be demonstrated with this fun little visualization. You can follow along if you want. You can specify a gigantic population. So you can work backwards and say, let's make up a population in the computer's mind so we know what it is. And then let's see how things work. And then we can randomly sample with a specific sample size. And we can do it 50 times or 20 times or whatever it is. And then we can calculate the confidence interval each time and then count the number of times or the percentage of times that those confidence intervals contain the true population mean. And since we created the population mean in the mind of the computer with our own little code, then we know what that population is. So if you're running R, you can just type these things in. You can install the animation package, and then you can load that, an that animation package using library animation. And then you can run this function, which is designed to make a fun little animation of how confidence intervals work. It's not my function. I wish it were. It's pretty neat. But somebody made it, and it's pretty neat.
So I'm going to I'm going to run this function. Conf int level equals 0.95, so a 95% confidence interval. Size equals 20. So let me switch over here to R. I've got those packages installed already, so let me just do this. Conf dot int level equals 0.95, size equals 20. So this is going to calculate 20 confidence intervals from the same population with 20 random samples from the same population. A population where we actually know what the population mean is, which we don't really know in real life, but this is the true interpretation of confidence intervals. So it's, comp it's calculating one confidence interval every second or second and a half. And over here, it's counting how many times the population mean has fallen outside versus inside the confidence interval. So let's just see. Oh, I think it was sample size equals 20. I thought size equals 20 is the number of confidence intervals, but I think it'll be 50 confidence intervals no matter what, and I just told it the sample size was 20, perhaps. So with a confidence interval that's a 95% confidence interval, we can see that the coverage rate here, the percentage of um, the percentage of times that the true population mean, which is this horizontal dashed line, that's the true population mean. This is like a histogram turned on its side with z equals zero right there. You can see that the true coverage rate is 96%. So out of 50 samples, we were pretty close to 95%. Two times in these situations, the confidence interval, we took this random sample and we calculated a 95% confidence interval, and it didn't actually contain the population mean. So, uh, if you don't understand what's going on here, you should try and um, think to yourself what you can do to try and understand it because it's actually quite important that you understand the way this is going. So I'm going to say sample size of, uh, or sorry, confidence level of 99, 99% confidence interval. So let's see what happens here. So what we should see is that about 99% of these contain, of these confidence intervals contain the true population mean. And that will happen because the confidence intervals are wider there's more of a chance for them to contain the true population mean. We would expect about one half of these out of 50, so one out of 100 or one half of these out of 50 to not contain the true population mean. Now, of course, it could be more than that because this is just random. This isn't the full population infinite doohickey thingy. But like I said before, averages even things out pretty quickly, especially with decent numbers of observations. So, so far our coverage rate is 100%, 1.0. Every one of these things has fallen there, has contained the population mean. So we didn't get any uh, confidence intervals that missed in this particular case. Now let's do um, a 90% confidence interval. Now you can see this is a smaller confidence interval and it's missing more often. Or well, it's more likely to miss. That one almost missed but it barely got it. So let's see, we should expect about five of these to miss in, f in 50, there's one. In 50 confidence intervals, we should expect about five of those confidence intervals to miss the true population mean, to not contain the true population mean. And this is the interpretation, the true technical interpretation of what a confidence interval means. If my confidence interval is, you know, four to 12, then we would, then what we can say is we're 90% 90, 90 confident that the true population mean lies between 4 and 12. But much more technically, we would say, if we were to repeat this over and over again, this study, getting a, new, a fresh random sample from the same population every single time, um, yeah, we were a little off. We had a coverage rate of 94%, and it should have been about 90%. So, but that's random variation. If we were to repeat our study over and over again, and get a fresh confidence interval and a fresh sample every time, then we would expect whatever percent of those confidence intervals to contain the true mean. So if it's a 90% confidence interval, then it's 90%. If it's 95%, then it's 95%, etc. So let's do a really small one. Let's do a 50% confidence interval, which we don't usually do, but they're very small and they're missing a lot. They should miss about half the time. So if we were to randomly sample over and over again from this same population and calculate a a confidence interval each time, we would expect about 50% of those confidence intervals to contain the true population mean. This interpretation doesn't tell you what that population mean is. 
this simulation is artificial because we actually know what the population mean is, but in reality we don't really know that. So all we can say is, we can't say anything about whether the mean is between our two numbers. All we can say is that if we kept doing this over and over again, this percent of the time we would find that our confidence intervals would contain the true population mean, which is why we like to do lots and lots of research. So here we're about we're up to about 45 percent. We would expect about 50 percent coverage. About 50 percent of these confidence intervals should contain this dashed line, the true population mean, and it was only 44. So sampling variation. So let's go back to this. So this is the super accurate interpretation of what a confidence interval means. If we were to repeat our study many, many times and calculate a mean in a 95% or whatever percent we had confidence interval for each of those sample means, then 95% of those confidence intervals would contain the true population mean. That's our interpretation. It has nothing to do with what our actual values are. If we want to include our values, we have to use the kind of fudgy subjective one that says we are 95% confident that the true population mean lies between this and this. So as a final question to think about, how many ways are there to reduce the size of the confidence interval, which is something we try to do all the time? How can you make your confidence interval smaller? What can you change about your research, about the way you calculate things, about your decisions, to reduce the size of the confidence interval? And for each way, what will the effect be? So if you increase this, will it increase or decrease the size of the confidence interval? There's at least three ways. So think about that. I could come up on an exam someday.